All right. Hello and welcome to the Self-Recording Band Podcast. I am your host, Benedict Hein. Uh, we are here once again streaming live from uh, the Studio Scene event, Studio Scene here in Hamburg. Uh, we're at the studio, Sofa. Uh, the guys at Sound and Recording, the people of Sound and Recording let us use this uh, so, uh, Sofa uh, for three days, which is great. And uh, yeah, that one, pretty comfy. <laughs> and yeah, so uh, as always, I'm here with my friend and co-host, Malcolm Owen Flood. Hello, everyone. And today we are joined by Jason Joshua. Hello. Thank you. Yeah. If you don't know, if you don't know Jason, I mean, you probably know, but if you don't know, um, it's a, he's about a, a, as big as it gets when he comes to mix engineers these days. I think. Uh, if you look at his credit list, it's massive. Uh, think of like you know, name ten artists in the big ten big artists you can think of in like pop, R and B, hip hop, any of these genres. Uh, and there's a high chance that he's worked with them. So uh, it's it's very cool to have you here, and uh, we have a ton of questions, and I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you. I love being here. Yeah. Awesome. <laughs> so um, the first question, Jason, is. Or my first question would be, we are, as you know, the, the, the podcast is called The Self-Recording Band. So we work a lot with, with our coaching program and our, and our audience are a lot of people who record themselves, who are DIY people. So for someone at your level, do you still ever get to work on like self-recorded stuff? Or do big artists these days sometimes record themselves at home? Is that something you ever deal with? I would say about out of every hundred times I go into the studio, maybe one time out of yeah. that hundred will be a recording session where uh, the mix p person involved with the mix would want to do an overdub or mm -hmm. recut a vocal mm. or something like that but once you kind of it's kind of weird once you are in a certain section of um, of the engineering world you kind of get lost in that so for 15 years I've done nothing but mix um, my predecessor, uh, Dave Pensado, I remember, um, I remember uh, doing something for him, putting a patch in or whatever, and he didn't know how to do it. And I was saying to myself, this is Dave Pensado, how does he not know how to patch in some outboard gear real quick or, mm -hmm. or what have you? And you realize once you take your focus off of something and you don't do it for a while, you become really bad at it. Yeah. <laughs> so I always tell my clients if they want me to ever record their vocal, they're going to get a great sounding vocal. It just might take some time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And in terms of like being sent something that has been self-recorded, that's yes. what I mean. Like when people send, like record themselves and send it over to well, you. Well, that's does that ninety. Happen? That's ninety percent of the mixes now. I, I, oh, really? I, I would say yeah. That's a lot of a lot of the um, well, a lot of the upper echelon uh, um, clients are buying their own studios now. So whether they mm. have their own studio in their house or they have their own studio somewhere else, uh, they're pretty much you know, self-contained. But a lot of the newer artists are understanding the value of saving money or keeping the money for their studio time. So basically, they're buying their own equipment and recording them in, themselves in the hotel studio. Yeah. Um, I, I've seen... Um, I've been in with clients where they'll have the big studio with the big microphones and the, and, and the engineer and everything's ready to go. And you see them in the ISO booth with their engineer and their mic that they're used to bypassing the, uh, the full studio. So yeah, I mean, right. it's, 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 it's now really getting into a more personal space when it comes to the recording of, of projects. I, uh, I think the big. I think we see this with the bigger studios closing. That a lot of, especially in rock, a lot of the. Uh, I mean, especially everything except rock. A lot of the uh, um, clients and artists are are preferring to uh, record themselves. Wow. Okay, now that's interesting. And is there any common thing you have to struggle with, or uh, yeah, is it shitty vocals? <laughs> yeah, yeah that, I was, I was thinking, yeah. <laughs> what? Because yeah. they don't. I mean, you, 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 have to understand. Technology has put people who, I mean, back in the day, to become uh, uh, an engineer, you really had to know your stuff. You needed oh, yeah. to know, you know, the room, the board, you know, how to record, how to get a great sound. But now, with you know the invention of Pro Tools and all this, these other great um, software programs. You know, anyone as a novice can start and record themselves if you have a, you know, a little bit of know-how, go on YouTube and figure it out. But there's an art to it that hasn't been taught. So that art is being lost in a vocal. I mean, I remember just 10 years ago, you would turn up a fader and the vocal would almost sound completely mixed because the right. person who recorded it has an ear 
and gave you something very, very, very fantastic to start with. Nowadays, you know, we get people who, who you know, all they want is to get the voice to the recorder. Right. And uh, they're not paying attention on what the voice sounds like. Mm -hmm. So, and then now in hip hop, that actual crunchy, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing sound <laughs> is now the sound. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. really popular somehow, yeah. It's yeah. now the sound. I don't know if you guys remember um, maybe in the late 90s, a group called the Wu-Tang Clan. In, yeah. uh, sure. And they came up with, the, you know, they did everything in their basement, you know, off, off a four track. They didn't care. It was just raw. And then everybody wanted to sound like that for some reason. And that <laughs> lasted about nine months. But their sound kind of took over. And that's the same thing with, you know, the, 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 the newer artists that are coming out now. It's just like I, I get mixes and I swear I've done the greatest mix in the world. And they'll come back and say it's too clean. Uh -huh. So you really have to... Uh, it's, it's, it's a balance. It's like you have to understand that, yeah, there's shitty vocals, but now how do I make these shitty vocals have a, 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 a sound of its own, I guess you could say. Awesome. Thank That's you. fascinating. Yeah. That actually brings us to like the next question that I really was wondering about, and that I think there's this misconception that at your level, everything's perfect and nobody ever asks for a mix revision and you just <laughs> you do whatever you want. You can do no wrong. But I actually would imagine that if I actually sit there and think about it that it's probably the exact opposite because you probably have more than just you know one singer saying hey my vocal sounds weird you probably have maybe their a and r involved are their managers involved like what's well, going I, I, on I, there? i'll give you a, i'll give you a recent story um me and my head engineer did a mix on uh, a co-mix on a record uh that was uh i guess you can say a fan or a person who's been a fan she had a little, you know, steam or little buzz going, but she wasn't the biggest artist in the world, but she was a super Jason Joshua fan. Oh my God, I cannot believe I'm getting you to mix my record. This is going to be the best experience I've ever had in my life. I, I, oh my God, you're the God. Just do whatever you want. I'm like, oh, this is going to be great. <laughs> <laughs> so, we start, so we start the record and we finish it and, you know, we're high-fiving each other and we're like, oh, this is really dope i'm happy to give this person who appreciates me so much a wonderful mix she wrote a letter <laughs> probably about 20 pages on how i ruined her life and the mix <laughs> <laughs> and she could not believe this was me <laughs> you got a restraining order oh and my <laughs> god it was, it was so disheartening i'm like I, I i don't understand what just happened so she's like there's something about the rough and you went so far away from the rough and then we listened to the rough i wonder if she's going to figure out if she ever saw this she's probably going to figure out who i'm talking about <laughs> but um um we got to the uh to uh hear her mix and it it just we couldn't understand it it was distorted right i think the luffs were at minus four perfect yeah. it was just it was it was pretty bad and we matched it perfectly sent it back to her she says I knew it. I knew you were the one to go to. It's like, so you get it. My point is, is you get this all the time. I mean, we are we are definitely in the world of technology where we have to worry about demoitis more than we mm -hmm. ever ever, and we have to respect the demo. But I've just, you know, I've been doing it so long that I've, you know, I only know how to mix one way, and that's just to make the record. I always tell people, I don't mix for the client. I mix for the record. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to make the yeah. record the best that I possibly be. If I fail, I'm sorry, but just know I'm doing and thinking of everything that I could possibly think of to make this record better. And and if you don't like it, I, I, I humbly apologize. And I would say right about now, I wouldn't say not like it, but I would say revisions wise, I would say we would get about 90% of the time we're getting revisions. Yeah. So there's maybe out of 100 mixes, maybe five will be no changes right oh, but yeah. uh pretty much everything after that is 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 a note yeah awesome. or yeah, two work mm -hmm. yeah thank you <laughs> that, that, uh, that's interesting uh that's and awesome. um and that's all that's yeah. all this i mean talking to yeah, my course, to yeah. my counterparts and talking to my colleagues and my peers we're all going through it now yeah. we're all really hot because you know when they when you do a mix you're spending about a day on it right mm -hmm. and when you're recording the record it's a process. You have a process where they get the, the initial idea down maybe, 
and then you know the engineer probably spends weeks upon weeks tweaking doing his little mix and then everybody's been listening to it for you know two or three months and then they get to the mix and everyone's used to the i mean it's it's just a scientific fact when you listen to something repetitively your body gets used to it so when it hears something different it goes into fight or flight mode mm. it's like what is this and it's no in between it's no like uh and it could be as simple as a hi-hat being up or uh, too many delays added um but one little thing can throw off the whole mix and they like i can't even listen to it past verse one wow. because there's a delay so yeah you I mean you do this for so long you hear so yeah. many so many different stories but you know for the most part Fortunately enough, the the uh, the other ninety five percent appreciate you know what we do. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So uh, yesterday we over there we learned that you really enjoy talking about AI. <laughs> <laughs> We're not going to no, go there. No, just kidding. <laughs> We're not going to go there. No. It's uh, not that I don't. Yeah, I know. It's, not, I know. it's, it's just it's so new. It's <laughs> like. You know, yeah, of course. I no. like it. I don't like yeah. it. I, nah. You know, who who knows? Yeah, just kidding. No, let's get back to mixing uh, because. You said something else over there yesterday that I uh, remember that I wanted to tell, uh, like, ask you about. You said you're taking chances when you're mixing. Like you're risking things. Sometimes you, you know, you. I'm risking the mix. Yeah, of course. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you, you can lose the you, you can lose the mix yeah. if you go too far. Yeah, I mean, yeah but you still do it. Been there. Yeah, you, you I do, still, I still. You do bold. You make the bold decisions. So I was wondering, do you do more of that if it's like a? "Quote unquote," like smaller project. Are you like more careful on bigger uh, things? Great, or great question. So, because you would assume, right, when it is a very massive project, you would play it safe. Great you don't want to mess it up. Great so, question. Uh, no, I go fight or flight every really? mix. Awesome. Um, I uh, I've been in situations where we'll be at odds where I'm speaking, and I and I know I'm probably one of the only ones who do this, but I'll I'll tell the clients like this does not sound good. Mm. Um, and uh, I'm willing to take you through the finish line with this, but don't put my name on it. Right. Mm. Yeah. Um, I've had that a couple of times. I've had a couple of times where it's like maybe I should walk off the project and 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 because I, I I always find it fascinating where this is all we do. Yeah. I mean, we're look at us. You yeah. guys came to to hear this podcast, sit here talk shop we're all like-minded we all love mixing this is all we think about but then you'll have a client come in and they'll have his best friend or his girlfriend there be like what do you think baby <laughs> i think he has too much bass and you're like you're really going to listen to the person who's <laughs> never been in this room or in this environment like this is all i do trust me one time but you know you after a while you totally understand that it has nothing to do with you and everything to do with them And what I mean by that is that you have a situation where you put your heart and soul into something, and if they don't see it the way you see it, it's maybe because they're having a bad day. Yeah. And and I would say about 90% of the time, the records that sound different or as different as the rough is because we believe as mixers that that rough is not going to work in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. So if, if I went to, like, if you if you go to a doctor and you say to a doctor, doctor, uh, my heart, it, it, it skips a beat. And the doctor says, take this pill, your heart will be great. Honey, should I take this pill? <laughs> no, you should try <laughs> green juice. <laughs> What, are you gonna listen to this? We're the only ones where the girlfriend might, might overrule. Yeah. Uh, us doctors of mixing over here. So yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> I never take it personal anymore. I used to early in my career. I'd be like, oh, my career is over. They hate my mix. You'll get two. Don't get two in a row. Oh, mm. if you get two, I don't like your mixes in a row. You just think, oh, I'm the worst. <laughs> But it, it's 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 not the case. Yeah. It's hard not to let it affect you though. But you, you just no. In the beginning, it, I was my because following my mentor Dave Pensado, he. He would get devastated. Mm. Like if someone critiqued his mix, it was like, no, oh, it's all. I'm like, Dave, what are you talking about? Right. But uh, after a while, you start seeing patterns. You're like, oh, okay, I, I get it. And 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 never take it personal. Just go on to the next mix because you'll do a hundred mixes, and and 80 of them will be amazing, and 20 of them you might have some. And that's just because those 20 people don't hear the same way. Everyone, yeah. everyone's ears are different. So you can't take it personal that that person doesn't like bass or doesn't like high end totally. or, you know, however you feel 
the, the record should be. Absolutely. Something that I feel like I really strongly believe and, and like that it makes me willing to make bold choices in a mix that I don't know if the client's going to like it. Like I have no idea, but I'm going to do it because I think, like you said, it's going to be the best choice for the song is that mixing is still a creative process and that you're still adding to the production at a production level. Like if you make something And that's repeat, a great, that's actually a great uh, way to put it because when you do that, that's when you start deserving the point. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, when you bring that production value to that producer or to that song or to that record, people start, wow, if we don't go to them, we're not going to get these extra bells totally. and whistles. You know what I mean? I, 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 I always tell my, um, my, my, my assistants, you know, you want to amaze the client to the point where they feel that they can't go nowhere else. And if they did, they wouldn't get the exact same sound because you're only as good as your last mix. You know right. what I mean? We have no advertising. There's no commercials for mixers. <laughs> So, you know, you're only as good as your last mix, so why not try to hit it out of the park? Yeah, and surprise them. And, or, and, and then you won't have mixes that are out on the radio that you feel like, I've done this, where you, you, know, you have a big, big, big record, but you're like, I, I, I really don't think this mix is good. Oh. And then you have to post it, and you know all your peers are gonna see it, and you're like, oh my God, I don't wanna post this. And I've been doing that lately. I've, I've had some pretty big <laughs> records come out of late, and I have not posted them because I just haven't appreciated the mix. And it makes it, it makes it fun. So now it's like with me, if you go on my page and you see the records that I put up there, it's records that I'm proud of. Right. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? In a sense of, and I can separate the two. I can always separate, you know, the work that I go into. And then it's finding, you know, I always tell people, finding like-minded creatives to yeah. create with. You know, you'll have somebody come in and you'll listen to a rough and it's like, I've had this a million times where they'll be like, the rough is amazing. And I'll say to myself, it's absolutely not. Maybe we should talk about this first because I'm hearing it in a different way. Mm -hmm. You know, you just want me to make it a little bit better. I don't think it's even, you know, so those type of early discussions are always, uh, always best. Yeah, that, well, that's that's actually really interesting. A pre-production meeting before a mix, and that's very hard to get. Yeah, that doesn't happen. You like, know, they usually ever. just send it and you know hope for you to knock it out the park. And that's another yeah. thing you always got to say to yourself: they came to you for a reason. They they want nothing more than to hear something absolutely amazing yeah. from you. Mm -hmm. So you can't take it personal that you know you don't hit it. You just you just fall back on the on the on the on the aspect of I tried my best. I did everything I could let the chips fall where right. they may. Is there anything you do to try and build trust with them so that the next time they come, they give you more leeway in, in being creative? I think the, tr the trust um, came early with me with, you know, finding, I always tell people, find your vessel. Mm -hmm. um, find that producer, find that act that truly believes in you. So I had uh, two producers, Tricky and Dream, who we did a lot of early stuff with Rihanna, Beyonce, um, Justin Bieber, Celine Dion. <laughs> and, and no, it was like really big pop records. And if you know anything about pop and mixing, there's only a couple guys out there that people go to. And, and for this young guy to come in, they had to stand up for me. Mm -hmm. And once they stood up for me, no, this is our guy, this is our guy, this is our guy. And then once you have success, now you're the guy. Right. So it's finding your vessels that that help get your information or get your mixes to you know whoever your your future clients are going to be. Like, oh I, man, I love that record, and that's where most of my my work comes from, is from people listening to records. Oh, that's Jay again. Let me. I got to go to Jay. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. One of the reasons that um, I think one of many reasons, but one of the reasons people come to you for your mixes is also your low end. You're kind of famous for that, at least over here. I don't know if it's the same or if you have get that, get that. but uh, many people that I talk to, they are raving about the way your low end sounds and how big it is, but also not overpowering. And um, so is, you probably answered that a thousand times already, but if there's one thing that you could point to, what is it that makes your low end sound like your low end? Side chain compression. Hmm. Oh, side yeah. side chain quick. compression is, is I, I can't do it any other way. And my, my whole thing was, I was in a, uh, I was in a loudness war with Fruity Loops. When Fruity Loops first came out, it was so loud, and their rough mixes were actually killing 
some of us engineers because but wait, wait how can how can a DAW be loud just so we understand like well Fruity Loops soft clipper is ah, okay. is amazing and the first I, I'll be the first if there's any develop, developers here <laughs> the first person who makes the Fruity Loop soft clipper for all the DAWs is going to be the king because oh, really? this thing cool. really, 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 really gets uh, records loud. And okay. a lot of the, the producers will, you know, do their rough mix and, you know, they put the Fruity Loops soft clipper. And I'm talking everything's going through it. Vocals, beat, kick drums, 808s. And it would, uh, it would be extremely loud and extremely distorted, but it had something to it. So we had to develop a system where I can get it just as loud, mm -hmm. but take away all the stuff, the bad stuff that the uh, soft clipper added, um, bring the dynamics back, bring the transients back, so on and so forth. So once we created this template or the system, I realized early, not only by um, trim tooling the, uh, the uh, what am I supposed to say? Trim tooling the uh, uh, 808 compression, mm -hmm. um, sidechain compression, I also use now Soothe which I'll take the kick drum, have the kick drum go feed the uh, Soothe uh, sidechain compressor, and every time the kick hits, the bass will drop out. Mm -hmm. And the reason why Soothe is so good is because it, it follows the envelope of the kick. So if the kick, it's not taking the whole thing down, it's just taking the energy of where the kick is coming in. So you don't even hear the 808 drop out. You just hear the kick come in and the 808 sustain all the way through. So it got me about two to three more dB of headroom. Wow. So I would say sidechain compression is absolutely the key to victory for me, for my low end. Because I like, I like a very sustained, in your face, you know, low end that makes people feel warm. I'm a, I'm a high fi guy. I like the lowest of lows. I like the mm -hmm. highest of highs. Mm -hmm. um, and, and with sidechain compression, it really, really got me to have that low end um, that I was looking for. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's great, great answer. answer. Great yeah. answer. Does your mix bus have also anything to do with it? Like, your, for example, the, the God Particle? Yeah, the God Particle is, uh, is, is, is remarkable in the sense of its control of, of the entire frequency spectrum with its uh, multi-band compressor, but especially in the low end. Um, it was something that we really, really harped on. It took us a minute to figure out. But... Um, if it's not the God Particle, I would say it's going to be pretty hard to get to the minus seven, minus six luff area and still sound dynamic without multiband compression on your two bus. Yeah. So with the God Particle having the multiband compression on the two bus and really, really uh, um, focused on the, uh, the, the control of the low end and keeping that last, um, I'll, I'll tell you a quick funny story. I was working with Murder Beats and uh, big time uh, producer, all the Drake stuff, so yeah. on and so forth. He's and got a uh, plug-in with Slate, I think, right? The Murder Melodies thing? Is that oh, wow, that's, I think so. that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. So um, he came in and he was, you know, a person like, you know, I love the mix, but doesn't, I'm not feeling the low end, Jay. And I'm like, telling someone like me that you're not <laughs> feeling the low end is like <laughs> the world's coming to an end. Like, <laughs> no low end, what are you talking about? And I, you know, so I go up on the big boys and I'm like, what are you talking about? We're killing yours. He's like, yeah, you are, but you're not killing it in these. And I'm like, well, what do you mean in these? He's like, I'm listening to it on my headphones. And he had his headphones. It was the weirdest thing. I'm listening to the mix, and I'm look I turn behind, and he has his headphones on, listening to the mix on his headphones. And I'm like, but you can... I'm like, never mind. That's, a, that's, a, <laughs> that's, that's another story. <laughs> so the way it works is that 20 and 30 hertz that I would roll away, these headphones would make it up in its synthesized based way where you can hear more low end if that 20 and 30 hertz wasn't rolled out. So we had to figure out a way of how do I keep that 20 and 30 hertz without getting the wobbles and the shakes and all the other stuff that it brings to it. So I think that was uh, mm -hmm. one of the uh, eureka moments with uh, the God Particle. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, is it always the God Particle on your mix bus? Yeah, I never. Yeah. I, since the uh, first day uh, we uh, hit that Eureka button where we finally figured okay. the God Particle out, I think it's been like three years now. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. Yeah. And so, um, it, I, from what you're saying, I get that. Do, do you do the, the mastering yourself then, or do you deliver mixes that are that why, loud? Why like not? Because we're like, yeah. we're, we're, I mean, 
a lot of people, a lot of people tend to not realize that most mixed engineers are really good mastering engineers yeah, as well, true. because they know what they want the record to sound like. And before it was kind of like um, a lot, like like a dark art of mastering. Like we knew what to do, but we really didn't know what to do. But over the years with the mastering plugins and the suites, you kind of started teaching yourself and people started talking and you realize like, wow, it's, it's really just taking a step back from your mix and coming back to it and figuring out how to make it better. And, and with the tools that, that we have today, I, I just don't see why yeah. most mix engineers don't master their stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and that's and, no disrespect to the no. mastering because there's some mastering engineers yeah whose ears are so good that you really like, you know what, I'm not going to them because of what they know, because I can do what they know. I'm going to them because I feel that their ear is helping my record. Yeah. Um, and I have a couple people that are like that when I need to take a, you know, a step away or if I'm feeling like there's something missing, I love the mix, I don't know what it is, let me see what, what their interpretation on the master is, but you know, I would say about right now, 90% of the time I master my yeah. own records. You can always do both too, right? Yeah. Like my master, my buddy's master, which one's better? That's all that What's matters. What's the funny thing is, is now the mastering engineers are becoming like mix engineers where they're asking for your ref yeah. The one that you yeah. sent the clients first. <laughs> they, like, hey, can you send me that? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Gotta make you, sure ne I it. you never got that. They never used to ask for that. Yeah. Now they're like, uh, can we get your bounce? Yeah. <laughs> and, and if you send it off to external mastering engineers, do you deliver it that loud still? Like, do you send the minus six, minus seven, or do you turn the God particle the last part of the chain down? For that? Um, I respect the art. I'm going to say my peers. I know this for a fact. My peers don't. They they yeah. send it as hot as yeah. it possibly can. You do what you need to do. Just either lay it in and don't touch it, or put a little whatever you think you need to do to it. But um, with me, I'm a little bit more respectful. If 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 my client is really asking me to send it to mastering, I'm not going to be the guy that's going to you know not send it. So all I do is take the limiter off the guard mm -hmm. particle. It goes down about five dB and. Uh, Hope for the best. <laughs> <laughs> Does it ever go wrong? Always. No. <laughs> awesome. You no, know, that's the thing. It's like, I mean, we're we're all good mixers. We're all good engineers. And if you trust your like, if you trust your ears, or if you have the complete confidence in your ears, why would you send it to anywhere else? Yeah. Yep. You know, it makes no sense. But like I said, sometimes you need to take a step back. And sometimes certain ears are better than yours when it comes to a two track. But um, for the most part though, I'm 90% of the time trying to master, well 100% of the time trying to master my own stuff. All right, right. Thank yeah. You. So, oh, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say, if you're not happy, why are you calling it done, I guess, right? So. Yeah, that's what I never understood, especially with you know the limiters. Like no one's sending out, uh, uh, I don't know who's doing that anymore, sending out a mix without a limiter yeah. on it. Like, oh man, you gotta listen to it with the vibe, man. Just turn it up. Like, no, dude. <laughs> if your shit's not hot, your shit's not going to get uh, picked up as 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 the mix. So I highly suggest, whenever you send your mix out, you send it as hot as you know, uh, commercially possible. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Thank you. So uh, bef before we wrap it up here, because I know you have to be in there for the sound check really yeah. soon, right? And I want to respect your time. So uh, does anyone here have questions for Jason uh, in the audience? Because we have a wonderful live audience as well here, which I appreciate. Uh, anyone has questions for Jason? Joshua? No questions. Amazing. It's the <laughs> first time I've ever sat in the audience without one question. Somebody's got one. No. <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. There we go. <laughs> Actually, yes, but just a short one. Um, going back to the uh, mixing for the biggest of the big clients uh, and the revisions of that, um, is there a difference in the number of revisions and the kind of revisions that you get from like great teams versus independent people? Uh, any given BTS record might have 50 revisions or more. 50? 50, 50. Oh. What? Yeah, it's uh, you have to understand. You're in a day and age where you know people. They know what they want. If it's a hi hat down 0.5 dB, no. Oh, I'm sorry, 0.2 now. <laughs> that's 
that's their, <laughs> their given birthright, man. They paid for the uh, for the mix, but yeah, it, it it doesn't matter. I think I don't think uh, I think the best way to give you the an, an average is the average mix for me is like version four or five, and in each version we're probably thinking about maybe five to ten notes. So people and and. It kind of affects you as a mixer because you're like, you say to yourself, all that extra shit that you want to do, maybe I shouldn't do it. <laughs> maybe I should wait because I'm about to get 50, 100 notes and then maybe make a suggestion. Or you can do what my, my mentor does, he, which I don't understand, but he, he, he takes the time and does it. He'll send out two versions. Oh. Mm -hmm. Here's the, your version cool down and here's the, this is where I think it needs to go. You know, adding drops, you know, stuff like that, that just gives excitement and movement to a record. You know, taking out a part here because it clutters with, because a lot of people don't understand when you work with, with, with music today, no one's making music together. The producer will make the beat, send it to the top liner, the top liner will write the record, not paying attention to what the producer wrote. And then the producer, all he cares about is the beat. And then he'll have a melody line that's going over the top line uh, or synth going over the top line, you're like, ah, let me mute that. And the producer will be like, what the fuck are you doing? That's my man. That's my shine. And I'm, I'm, I'm like, you're stepping over the lead vocal. No one's coming in. No one's, you know, paying money to hear your synth. And if unless it was like a huge melody, but you know, it's like I said, it, it doesn't. Like most newer clients, they're afraid to give you notes. But the bigger clients, oh. <laughs> I remember one time we got to what's Mike Mike what's the what's the big version that we got to with that one record like version 59 the uh, uh, BTS record so think about it you're in the 40s after five you probably don't even know what the record sounds like anymore. it's, <laughs> yeah. a, to yeah. it's a totally different it's a totally different record so then that's because that's the main reason why i have all my assistants do my uh do my changes yeah because it's like i don't want to see my baby ruined <laughs> it's too, too much <laughs> too much <laughs> too much awesome awesome thank yeah. you any more questions there it is use this chance Nick. Oh, yeah, we got away. Um, can can you explain something about your template, like the thought process behind it, and why you build like like the way it is? Well, my template is very very OCD. Um, it's color coordinated. It's. Uh, basically put together so I can get through a mix and get all the bullshit out of the way as fast as I can so I can become extremely creative very, 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 very quickly. We all know, we've all done mixes where it takes us, you know, two or three hours just to get the mix prepped, get the fades in, get all the clicks out, blah, blah, blah. By the time we start mixing, we, uh, we hate the record. So I came up with a system where it's, you know, relatively simple my assistant set up the record so when i bring it up it sounds exactly like the rough um but uh my template is so i can isolate each individual parts of the record and really attack them like i'm mixing them uh, uh individually so what i mean by that is like i'll have the drums with the drum bus so now i can mix and master the drums before it even gets to the two bus, so the two bus doesn't have to do anything. I have my high-end perks, same thing. I have my synths and my uh, 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 keyboards, and then I have my uh, sound effects and vocal effects. So with all that being said, I like to mix and master before I get to the two bus. I treat the vocals like a mix and master. So when I get to the two bus, it's not doing anything. So when we are at minus seven, minus six loves, it still feels like it's open, like it's at minus 14, minus 15. So I just like to isolate each individual um, section. And when, if you go into uh, the, uh, the master class next, I'll get very, very in depth uh, with mm. that. Awesome.
Awesome. Yeah. Go check out that master class. Oh, it's a yeah. no-brainer. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. All right, do we? I don't know. I think we got to wrap it up. We got to wrap it up. Yeah, time, gotta, but, but gotta go in there for the sound check. Station thank you guys, well, man. man. I appreciate you. Thank, thank you so you much for, for your time, thank and you. thank you guys for listening live. If you watch the stream, thank you for listening on the podcast. If you watch this after the fact, and of course, thank you guys for being here live, yeah, uh, thank you all. joining us. So a big round of applause for Mr. Jason Joshua. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.